on. So hi, everybody, and welcome to the webinar for STC IDL, which is Society for Technical Communication, Instructional Design and Learning. We run a webinar series, and today we are going to hear from Dr. Jackie Damrow, and we're going to talk about the juicy subject of imposter syndrome. Her title is expert or imposter, and I love that. Uh, let's see. I've, I've got a whole biography, uh, a short paragraph of biography on Jackie, but a lot of us know her because Dr. Damrell, she is a business professional. She's done a number of webinars for us. One of them was on BPMM, uh, business process. Modeling notation. Modeling notation. Thank you. Um, she is a noted speaker. She speaks at the STC summits, um, some of the regional summits, and also the international summits. She also, I believe you're on the education committee for STC. Correct. A third, third year of uh, co-chairing the education committee. Beautiful. So not only does she present, but she helps other people present, which is great. You're also a LavaCon presenter. Yes. So you've got lots and lots of flair on your person, mm -hmm. lots and lots of buttons and yes. lots of street, street cred. Yeah. So we're, um, I'm going to say, take it away, teach okay. us something that we need to oh. know. All right. Well, I will. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And as Vicki said, I don't know how to say no to STC. <laughs> and I don't know how to say no to LavaCon, so I kind of am in both camps as far as conferencing type of stuff. Uh, but also for STC, I am the book review editor on the Technical Communication Journal, which is our pre uh, academic journal STC provides. So if you ever want to do book reviews, please reach out. I'm always taking people. And um, I also am an STC fellow and... Um, have had a long ties with IDL SIG. I was a SIG uh, manager a long time ago and uh, no longer in the IDL space. So it's kind of why I departed, but I have kept my friendships with Mary Lee and Vicki and others. So they pull me back every now and again. So on this topic of, um, let's see, trying to, I've never done this part before. So, okay, there we go. So what we're going to talk about today is first, I'm going to give a brief summary of what the expert syndrome is, because if you think imposter syndrome is the only thing out there, no, there's an expert syndrome as well. So they go hand in hand. So in order to understand what an expert thinks they are, will help you understand what an imposter thinks they are and how we can really squash our feelings for either one, because we can be either one. It just depends. Then I'll give you some uh, tips on how to tame your internal imposter. Um, I struggle with this every day. I actually had an imposter moment today that I'm kicking myself in the pants. So um, even though I have done this topic for at least a year, it still bites me. So it will continue to bite you, but I look back at these slides and I go, okay, you can get over this. And so if I can, you can. And then I'll give you a resource list of where all of my research came from. And this will be somewhat interactive. Please interrupt me during uh, this discussion. If you have a question, raise your hand or put it in the chat. And I'll uh, hope that Vicki will catch that because I may not be able to catch it all. So stop me when you can, Vicki. Um, but let's okay. start off with... Um, what does Google say? The infamous everybody goes and sit, searches Google. Well, for expert syndrome, at the time that I did this, which was a few, about a couple of months before the May STC summit or June, whenever it was, um, I did a quick research or, or search on expert syndrome. And in 38 seconds, it told me there's 3,630 results of people who are searching for expert syndrome. And I'm like, okay. So then I did a search on imposter syndrome. And in 55 seconds, I got over 1 million searches for imposter syndrome. So that is indicative in itself that 
a lot of us out here are thinking we're imposters and trying to find out how we quell that feeling within us. Um, so these results were done on November 28th, 2021. That was when I was submitting the uh, session for SDC approval. So what do you think those results mean to you? What would they mean to you? Anyone? We all think we're imposters, or more of us do. <laughs> exactly. We struggle with that every day. So let's take a look at what the expert syndrome really is. It does have an official name, Dunning-Kruger effect. And Dunning and Kruger were two doctors who did a lot of research about um, why people felt that they were experts. Now, they didn't do so much research on imposter syndrome. Theirs was mostly in the expert syndrome space. So based on Wikipedia, um, it says that the expert syndrome is a hypothetical cognitive bias stating that people with low ability at a task overestimate their ability. And the bias results from an internal illusion in people of low ability and from an external misperception in people of high ability. So in other words, some people think they're an expert when they're not. And some people who don't think they're an expert really are. And those are us. There are things that we know in our toolkit very, very, very well. And there are things that we don't know so well. But we as technical communicators know how to go find and improve ourselves because we know what to do. We know how to Google. We know how to do whatever. We know how to learn a tool that we don't necessarily know. And if we don't know it, we go find somebody in our network that does know it and say, hey, teach me this. Well, to kind of bring the expert syndrome around a little bit, there was an example given by um, um, Dunn and Kruger. So let's kind of look at the, um, let's see. Yeah, there was an example done by Dunn and Kruger that um, they found this gentleman named MacArthur Wheeler was brought to court on a criminal case. And why was he brought to court? Well, in April of 1995, Mr. Wheeler robbed two banks. Nothing new there. Banks get robbed most of the time. But while robbing these banks, Mr. Wheeler covered his face with lemon juice because Mr. Wheeler did some research and found that if you cover your face in lemon juice, you will become invisible to the surveillance cameras. Now, this was his, his belief that was based on a misunderstanding of the chemical properties of lemon juice as an invisible ink. Was he an expert? <laughs> no, he just misread the research. So he went and robbed two banks, and he's now nice, nicely withheld in the pokey. So, you know, Mr. Wheeler got caught by the law for doing what he thought was a really nice thing to make him invisible to the surveillance cameras. So invisible ink maybe, but not surveillance cameras. <laughs> so in order for you to recognize the um, signs of expert syndrome, Suzanne Lucas in a 2017 study says that um, they have an answer for everything. So this is the, what we would call the know-it-all answer for everything. Um, if they say they're researching, they're doing what the rest of us are doing. They're Googling. Um, and they're the ones that are quick to say, uh, I think it's X, but let me double check. Now, how many of us have honestly said that? Raise your hands. I have two. Um, but I always thought that was a nice thing to say because it's like, I really don't know, but let me go check. And I'm like, okay, am I an expert in this case? Perhaps not. And this, uh, an expert is also the person that claims total consensus, that everybody feels this way. Everybody's going to, you know, jump off a bridge uh, because I told them to jump off a bridge. Are they really going to jump off a bridge? Who knows? Another um, research that I read was from Laura Burgles, who she said people with expert syndrome actually think they understand topics deeply or do things well. They feel they possess an incredible wealth of experience, talent, and knowledge. 
It sounds hard to believe, but someone can demonstrate a long track record of failure and still project confidence. And often, often the public will overlook their obvious lack of knowledge, talent, and experience. Instead, they'll fall, fall for the swagger. So basically, you can bluff people all the time or bluff people some of the time. It kind of goes back to what do you believe and how, what, how convincing were they to sell you that bridge in New Jersey? So going on to, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on an expert because we're mostly here to learn how do we take care of that imposter and what is that imposter? So imposter, it can be a syndrome or a phenomenon. It's one and the same. You'll hear people get them confused quite a bit. It really is the same. And Emily Stanislaus um, defined imposter syndrome as a psychological pattern in which Someone questions their skills, talents, or qualifications and becomes afraid of being exposed as a fraud. How many of us have felt that way? Do you think we'll ever get lose that ability to fear that? No, that's innate human behavior, really. Um, so, and she felt that if it's not addressed, imposter syndrome can have long-term negative effects on our mental health and well-being, and it does. I mean, I can say like my situation that occurred today is I'm still sitting here kicking myself in the pants. I will get over it in a day or two, but it helps me honestly self-reflect and look back and go, am I really not knowing something? Stick my foot in my mouth. What do I need to do? Why do I feel this way? And I have a very good friend that all I have to do is send her a chat message is, says imposter and she'll send me back a message kicking the pants and so i get it that i have to get over it uh, so hopefully you can find a true friend that'll do that to you as well because it it helps sometimes so looking at the uh, imposter syndrome from a different perspective of how we really see ourselves is in the, on the left side you see the little orange circle that says what I know versus what other people know. And that little circle of what I know, we often feel as that is us. We know this much about something and others know that much. And we don't want to look bad to somebody that we don't know what we say we know. And that's really not true because it really is a uh, that, um, connection point on the right side of that um, diagram. We know what we know. Other people know what they know. And where we meet in the middle here is what we collectively agree that we know. But we know certain things other people don't know. They know things we don't know. So we need to become happy with we have a shared commonality, but there are things outside of each of our purviews. So do you feel this way? Have you ever felt that way? Nope, nobody wants to participate. Okay, moving on. Okay, I see hands raising or they're not just not raised. Okay, they're just agreeing with me and that's fine. So taking imposter syndrome even further, you know, we as humans get confused. Well, apparently the movie industry is no better than the rest of us because they put out two movies, one by Tony Curtis with the Great Impostor, O-R, and then a sci-fi thriller with The Impostor, E-R, which is the correct spelling. Anybody want to take a guess? E-R. E-R. That's what most of us would do, but, you know, for some reason, O-R is just as prominent as E-R. To me, O-R looks wrong. But maybe that's, I'm going to say this probably badly, but it, I think it's more an American grammar thing than maybe an international grammar thing. I'm not sure. Um, so what can we do uh, as technical communicators? Why do we feel uh, like imposters? Uh, one of us might say, yes, 
uh, we often write documentation as we're learning the product and service. Are we an imposter? Not really. We don't know what we don't know till we start delving into it and researching it and using it. As we're using it, we're learning and teaching ourselves. And just before this call, Marilee and Vicki shared that they're learning things about Zoom that they didn't know before. And it's just <laughs> all through experimentation. So I'm going to call on y'all. Because, you know, do they feel like imposters? Probably with this tool they do because they don't know everything, but they're discovering little things here and there. And it's like, oh, now I know that. Um, so that's us. So do we know everything? No, we don't know everything. We never will know everything. I mean, do you know every little thing about the product or the service that you write for or you train for? Do you know every inch of it backwards, forwards, up and down? Are you the expert or just the person that's doing the, what is asked and you know a small bit and others know a small bit and you get all the collective bits together, then you have a full-fledged team. And that's what technical writing is, is a team. So how do we mitigate this imposter in us? Um, we learn as much as we can before we write the documentation. I mean, if you're gonna write about um, uh, cancer therapy, say you've never worked in that field before, what are you going to do first? If you have to write a user document about cancer therapy, you're going to go do some research. You might do a lot of Googling. You might go to the local library. You might read some medical journals. You're going to do what you need to do to try and build up your knowledge about that area. You might talk to some doctor friends or reach out to your network in STC who are medical writers and say, hey, what do you know about X? Vicki. So we have a we have a comment in the chat. Ah. Uh, it's from Francis. She says uh, regarding expert syndrome, some professionals are encouraged or trained to state that they are fully confident in certain knowledge when they're not. For example, doctors are often told to project confidence to reassure their patients. So. Uh, she says, so I appreciate learning about expert syndrome and to be aware of its prevalence. I think we can all agree, but I know yeah. I, I want a doctor who'll pretend because, you know, when, when I'm down uh, with something medical, uh, I may or may not want total honesty in the moment, you know, I don't want a doctor that's going to stand up and say, you, you really need a second opinion. I'm not good at this. Yeah, and I'm kind of on the fence with the doctor because they'll say something. I'll go, is that really it? I'll ask 20 questions and then they'll kind of admit, well, I really don't know. I need to go ask someone else. Well, then please go ask someone else and then come back and tell me. You know, don't well, I I bring this up, Jackie, is that I actually didn't know about expert syndrome. Um, uh, and I think it's interesting to learn about because um, as a technical writer, you make a really good point that. Um, we usually are in a position where we need to go and find more information. And I don't think we feel at all awkward about that or saying, hmm, I don't know, let me go talk to the right person or let me go find a subject matter expert. But I've run into uh, <laughs> enormous numbers of people, including my lovely dad, <laughs> who, you know, there are just tons of people who I think were trained, were socialized to say, oh yeah, I know about that. Oh, that must be, oh, I'm absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's so much a default as it is just the way that you're trained to be. My sister is a doctor and she tells me that one of the more refreshing things she hears is when she says, I don't know. I don't know that I'll find mm -hmm. out because patients tell her, oh, usually doctors say, oh, I know, I know. And so I think then what's the reason I appreciate you bringing this up is because it would help me in a work environment to realize, oh, this person isn't being an obnoxious know-it-all. They probably just feel that they are reassuring me by saying, oh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And it's it's good for me to be aware that that may just be something I need to take at face value and continue with my own research if I feel it's necessary. It's very true because people that do that, that yes, they are conditioned because they don't want to look like they know less than they know. And they want to look, look um, good in your eyes and feel that you will feel le less um, favorable about them if they don't know. 
And so they're embarrassed to say that they don't know. And I say, we own our embarrassment. We own our imposter. If we don't know, I have no problem saying, I don't know. But to the imposter syndrome thing, I will say, let me, I'll go research that because I want to know. And to me, that if I say that statement, I better darn well go do it. Now, I have in my career gone to subject matter experts that I know they didn't know anything. And they claim they did. And then I would write what they told me. And then someone else would review it. Some other person, say an engineer. So I'd go to two engineers. One engineer is the absolute subject matter expert. The other one is a peer reviewer. Well, whoever told you this is wrong, the second one would say. And I'm like, well, I got that from my main person. Oh, well, he or she doesn't know anything. This is how it should be. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, so it's... Uh, Finger pointing situation is not nice for any of us. So that's why I would say as technical communicator, where we can, we need to go do a research just as much as our other folks. And um, so we have sure a that we understand. We have a comment in the chat from Bobby. And mm -hmm. she said that not knowing it all is helpful. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And also, uh, she writes, uh, I, I think this may be a snarky comment. I may not, uh, I'll have to check. Practicing medicine. Mm. Hmm. So, and let me just remind you guys, you can raise your own hand if you want to uh, grab Jackie's attention. She seems to see our hands go up. Yes. And, and we would love to hear your voice if you're brave right. enough. So, um, I'm going to go ahead with how do we mitigate this imposter within us and um, what I kind of have intimated is we need to learn as much as we can before we write the documentation. We need to do our own research. We need to get in play with the tool if it's an actual live thing we can play with. In my case, what I'm writing um, user stories for business requirements. All I have is a design mock-up. And that prototype is somewhat clickable and somewhat not. So I have to try and figure out, well, the designers didn't put every instance of how a user can use this thing. So I have to sit and analyze every screen and go, how could the user come in this at the wrong way? How could they click off of something and go somewhere else? I can't know that specifically. So I rely a lot on my developers to tell me those scenarios where they they see that I might not see that a user could go down a rabbit hole that wouldn't be right. Um, but I have to try and do what I can based on the UI that I see. So, um, you know, I'm asking the designers because they were close in the uh, requirements as, a, as I was. And it's like, why did you design it this way? What if that happens? Why is this color that color and not some other color? Because, hey, color accessibility is a thing. And they're like looking at me like I have horns on my head because I'm asking about accessibility. And it's like, oh, well, these are plumbers out in the field for new home construction. I'm going, they're just as liable to have eye problems as the next person. Just because they're physically in the trades doesn't mean they don't have the same issues that any of our users would have. Um, you know, I do an audience analysis or interview uh, your SMEs. Uh, what I find here works really is if I can come up with the questions and give them to my SME in advance, that really makes them feel they're the expert when they're not really the expert, but they know what I'm going to come and ask, and then they ask it, and I get an answer that should be legitimate. And an audience analysis is always great if you can get in uh, with your absolute users. Now, for me and my job, we're not allowed to talk to the users. How many of you have had that told to you? You can't talk to the users. Should we raise our hands? Sure. Or share, share a story if you've got one to share. <laughs> so, I, I mean, frequently... I don't get to talk to my users. Um, I can volunteer like to job shadow, mm -hmm. but 
um, it would be special. And I'm, the message is that I would be interfering with the business of running the company uh -huh. if I do. And there, I've also worked on um, web help that goes to a customer or a client base. And that would, the message would be, I'm definitely not going to, because what if I ask them something like, hey, what's hard about this, you know? And uh -huh. then that would give a, sort of an anti-marketing message that, right. gosh, our software is hard to use. So anybody yeah. else? I'm going to say I my my situation the same as yours, Vicki, is we can't talk to our immediate users, which are within our own company, because we would be taking them away from their daily work that they need to do. We can talk to their manager and get if their manager feels that they can spare them for 30 minutes. That's all we get. We have to time box our time quite well. And so usually we end up meeting with the manager and that's who gives us the information. But that's not the real user. I mean, how many of us think that our managers know what we do? They probably know a subset of what we do. But. Um, and then the last piece here is uh, extinguishing the imposter. Um, you want to do this by having a starting point or a set of questions to ask your audience or SME. So that kind of helps us. If we do our research and we come up with the questions we think are valid or that we need to know, and by providing them in advance, we feel better about ourselves because we know we're not the imposter. We did our research. This is what we found. These are the questions we have. And so to our uh, subject matter experts or to those managers, you know, I need information on this. I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be. So therefore, can you provide me these answers? And um, it's kind of a better statement than saying, I don't know this, can you share it with me? It's just, I'm not as knowledgeable in this area as others might be, can you share with me? And that tends to sometimes open a door that you honestly wouldn't think would be open. Um, so imposters um, generally believe that their success is from luck or an outside factor rather than their ability or hard work. So, um, you know, we, we take what we can get where we get it from. We're overly sensitive to criticism about our writing or whatever it is we may do. Um, I like helpful comments. I like positive pats on the back occasionally. And when I don't get those, sometimes I begin that imposter starts to wear out, come out on me. And that's what happened to me today. I was given a criticism I didn't take kindly to, and um, I have to get over it. Um, we are often afraid that we'll be found out to be fake or phony, and I would say we need to quell that. And um, coming up, the next two slides, I'll show you some tips for how to quell that imposter or that fake or phony feeling. We often feel that our achievement or success as a writer provides enough, doesn't provide enough affirmation. Again, we don't get enough positive pats on the back because a lot of times we are the tail end of the dog wagging on a project. Um, all the design, the development is done up front and we are the ones scrambling behind to create all the wonderful documentation for the user because we're not in the in the room at the front of the project, we're in the room at the back end of it, Vicki. So uh, make sure, yeah, there we go. So uh, Adele has got a comment on number three. Mm -hmm. um, she says that that tends to, uh, she, well, what she typed was, they tend to keep to themselves related to number three. Mm -hmm. you know, when we feel like we're going to be exposed as a faker of phony, we just, cocoon I guess is probably yeah, we better. do we stay in our little hole we don't want to go out or if somebody's called us on it we will um I don't know that we mope but we kind of hide until we get over that uh we get our confidence back that and get back on an even keel until we get hit with it again which is again you know I'll keep saying I hit me today and I'm like okay got to get over this it'll be a day or two and I'll get over it and go back to not thinking about it 
So as soon as we can exercise it out of our brains by doing just some, con what helps me is I reflect back on what I have done well and try and kick myself with, you've done all of these things well. Well, this is one blip in the day. It does not really matter. Um, I had a former boss tell me one time, a long time ago, he said, if you can answer um, no to three questions, it doesn't matter in life. And it's like, the first question was, did anyone get hurt today? No. The second question is, did anyone die today because of this action that happened? No. Do you feel that you could have done anything differently in the current moment that you that would have prevented whatever from happening? No. Then get over it. And that's the three things that I took away from that particular person. So, Francis? Yeah, I have a question. So, um, the specific type of imposter syndrome issue I've run into, and I think other technical writers have run into as well, is managing expectations about what I should know. Mm -hmm. so what do I mean by that? Um, when I interviewed for a job many years ago, I was asked to interview for a job working at Amazon and they needed to, to create developer docs for the uh, Kindle Fire. And I said, oh, you need a programming writer. You know, I, I, I'm not a programming writer per se. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we have developers. We've had a programming writer. Wasn't a good match because they knew how to program, but they didn't know how to write. We need somebody who knows how to write, knows how to manage content. Oh, okay. So I went in and interviewed. But when I went in and interviewed, I interviewed with the developers themselves, and they usually only interview other programmers. And they said, oh, what do you know about programming? <laughs> so I think something that's interesting to me, and I found it in a lot of jobs, is that the imposter syndrome that some of us encounter is not maybe even has to do with our writing or our ability to write. It's our ability to meet others' expectations of what a technical writer should be providing. and how to set then expectations correctly about what our role is. And I'm just wondering if that's something people have run into. Anybody want to share? I will. So I think, go for it, Sue. I think Francis is spot on. Thank you for bringing it up, Francis. I was hired as a tech writer and documentation specialist for electronic health records. And I've been asked to be an information architect, to be um, a SharePoint developer, to be a um, content, uh, like a information management person, like data management, and it's overwhelming. And it's, it's sort of that weird position where you, you don't, want them to find out you don't know, but you don't know, and it really is kind of unreasonable for them to expect you to know. Um, and so there is not enough time in an eight day week for me to learn all of this and learn it fast enough and well enough to do it tomorrow. So it really does drive the imposter syndrome does drive it. And uh, to both of you, I'll say yes, uh, you're spot on and correct. I mean, my current role, I hired on as a, a scrum master. That's all I'm supposed to do, scrum master. And I am now a, some projects I'm a scrum master, some projects I'm a project manager, some, I on both projects, I am writing the user requirements. I am, um, having to test the user requirements. And we have a testing department, but it's like, oh, well, you can test just as well as they can. It's like, I wrote the stuff. I shouldn't be testing the stuff that I wrote. Just like a developer shouldn't be testing what they developed past unit testing. And that's why you have a QA team. But I'm constantly told, no, you need to test with QA. And I my current job, I said, I will test in QA, which is not my strong suit. I did not go through my profession to be a tester. That's not something I really like. But here's how I will do it. I will do 
paired testing. You give me a QA resource, we sit side by side, much like you do with development. They do paired development all the time. Let me do paired testing. We will sit side by side. We will test exactly the same thing. And we have three different devices. Uh, two are Apple, one is Android. It's like, I will test Android because that's the interface I know the best. The other person, they can test the Apple side. They know that the best. We test exactly the same thing, the same time. And that way, I we have minimized the number of bugs that we find on stuff because I can enter one bug or one story that hits all of the devices because that's the way we've done it. And that has streamlined everything. And they're like, well, how did you think of that? I said, because you kept asking me to test and I don't like doing it. So if I have a partner, I feel better because I'm learning off of him and he's learning off of me because we test differently. We see things differently. So I see Adele says, can that lead to perfectionism and be more harmful to our work? Where do we draw a line if that is even possible? Um, well, if you're an introvert, which I am, uh, perfectionism, yes, that is kind of me. But again, I have to kind of let it go. I don't, I don't see that it's harmful. It's perfectionism in a certain area that I will hold try and true and fight my battle. And there are th things that I will not fight a battle. I'll let it go. I will compromise just to make it go away. So, um, and then um, if there's no more, I'll continue on. The fifth thing that an imposter feels is we continue to feel like a phony or a fake. So let's talk about some ways that we can quell this. So the first, um, set of principles I want to kind of share are those that power speaking in my research had six practical actions. And then there's another set behind this that came from Write the Docs on imposter syndrome. So let's see, Bobby says, um, if you're not trained as a tester, that's a bigger problem. One from rule where she works is you don't take on work you're not trained to do. I would agree with you, Bobby. But they're so adamant that I have to be testing the stuff that I just have caved in. And that's the only reason I set put the put the criteria that you must uh, I must test with the QA person at the same time because that's how well I don't like testing. That is just an area I can learn. And I'm still never going to say that I would like to ever, ever be a QA tester. But if I have to do it. I'm going to do it with someone that makes it at least somewhat enjoyable if I have to live through the pain. So yes, I did come up with a compromise. So let's look at what power speaking says are the six practical actions. I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but you can see that the um, gist of these are to um, Basically, embrace your success and failure using the I language when you speak. So that's why I'm saying when I'm kicking myself in the pants, I'm reflecting on what were my successes in the recent past. And, you know, knowing that I can do better or I was successful at this. And, oh, by the way, I failed at this other thing. But did I really fail? I just didn't know everything I needed to know, or I didn't sufficiently research the thing that I should have, or maybe I didn't ask the right questions. What would, what questions would I ask now if it were to occur again? And I'll write those down. So the next time I have to ask questions, I'll look at this uh, document of questions that I should ask about a particular product or service that I'm working on. And then I have those in my area of expertise because how many of you have worked on a pro one product that has gone out the door and you never see it again? Or a document that ever has gone out the door and you never see it again? It never comes back for revisions for anything, phase two, release two, release 2,415. We never get rid of a document, do we? Anybody? Mary Lee? Nope. You're just raising your hand. Yes, we don't. Projects never go away. They always come back around. And we're always hoping that the person 
the other team member will get assigned that project the next time. We did our penance, give it to somebody else, let them learn the lessons that we learned. We want something different. Well, we don't always get that request. So we have to learn to just embrace it. And being an assertive speaker, um, you know, the key to everything is body language, knowing how to read body language. Um, I have a certain rapport with uh, one of the leaders of my company that I can read his body language so well. People go, well, how do you know when to shut up and when not to, I, I watch him and I know when he has certain, certain tells that I just stop talking. I don't continue on and other people will continue chat, 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 chat. And he'll finally finish whatever he's doing. He'll go, can you go back over that, uh, that again? I wasn't listening. And I'm like, if you listen, if you watch him, stop talking, let him do whatever he's doing. Then when he comes back to you, then continue on because then his mind connects the two pieces where he left off, where he stepped out of the conversation physically, he'll remember and go on. If you keep chatting while he's doing whatever he was doing, he loses uh, focus. Um, our emotional tone. Uh, I am a very emotional person, so I will be sitting in my office boohooing sometimes, crying into tissues because somebody said something, and I'm just like, I have to turn my back to the door so nobody sees me, but I have to let it out, so I am very emotional, and at our primary skill of active listening, we have to actively listen to um, ourselves as well as others, because that's how we will stop that imposter from coming, because we're actively listening for those signals we know are imposter signals to ourselves. You'll Now that you kind of know a little bit more, listen for yourself when you say certain things and go, okay, you know, like I said, I kick myself in the seat of the pants. It's like, okay, I know that was not right. So I'm actively listening to my own inner self and trying to learn how to quell that inner self to do differently. Um, okay, trying to watch chat here too. All right, uh, any questions on what Power Speaking says? Anyone want to bring out one of these other topics that I may not have brought out and you want to share an experience of your own? Jackie, while you were um, sharing on ways to sort of quell my internal imposter. I was also thinking when I do these kinds of things, then I feel like I go over into expert syndrome. Mm -hmm. That I cannot find the happy medium it, or it's very, well, maybe I can, maybe I can't. But anyway, it just seems to me like I'm at one extreme or the other. I have a hard time knowing what size I am, you know. Um, I do try to f figure out on the teams that I'm working with currently, my job is to be a technical writer. I don't have to be an expert in, I work for a bank, so I don't have to be an expert in regulations or in processes. I just have to know how to get things that, the information that comes in and make it readable and clear, you know? And so I don't, I, I don't fall into the temptation of saying that I know all about, you know, the processes, but I do know Word really well, right? And I uh -huh. do know HTML really well. And sometimes when I'm asked a question, uh, I will give the thing that I'm 90% sure is the right answer. And then I'll find out that it's not, right? And so then I feel like, a failed expert syndrome, and then I run into imposter syndrome. And so uh, how, do we, how do we know what size we are? How do we, how do we keep from going from uh, beast to mouse, right? Give me just a second. I've got to send a text. I've got a child trying to come home and tell him to call his grandfather. Um, okay. That is, unfortunately, there's no easy medium on there. You're going to feel an expert in some areas. You're going to feel an imposter in some areas. And you're going to know what you do know. And in the middle is what you do know. 
Mm -hmm. um, so really there, you're going to go on either extreme, but be confident when you go. I mean, the only one message I can say is your confidence is what's going to exude that you know it or you don't know it, but go with confidence that you are not going to ask the wrong question because you're just asking. And how are you going to expand your knowledge if you don't ask a question? If you don't show some vulnerability, because again, your experts don't know it all either. Does that answer your question, Vicki? It kind of does. I guess okay. this is it's kind of an art form, right? Yes, it is an art form. And so we're going to failed expert syndrome. Is that right? Oh, I, we uh, just have to embrace what we do know and what we don't know is well, what I'm going to say. I, I, one of the things that I try to keep in mind is it's okay to be wrong. Yes, it is okay to be wrong. And we have to accept that we're we're not going to know all the answers. And I would not want to be that person that says that I know all the answers when I don't. Um, so I know we're coming up on time. So um, just um, just a couple more slides here. So um, according to Write the Docs, they gave you seven tips. Um, this will be in the handout that you will get. Uh, but what I found here is your role isn't to, isn't to know everything. So this kind of goes to what you're saying, Vicki, but to synthesize the knowledge of everyone working on your product in a form that mo is, is of most benefit to your users. So this is goes along with, we know what we know and we need to gather others to bring in their knowledge and almost like a panel discussion kind of thing. If I know certain things and I can bring the others in to start sharing their experience or their knowledge, then I don't look as much of an imposter as I thought I did because I am pulling the others with questions. I'm pulling them into the conversation and they may sit there like a bump on a log, but if I can get them talking and sharing, then maybe I'm not the imposter I thought I was. I'm really the expert because I'm getting them to give the information they didn't want to willingly give. Um, so um, I think that's the only thing on this one I wanted to share. And then here in conclusion really is all I can tell you all is to be yourself. Don't be anything that you really aren't that you can do this. No one can take away the knowledge that you do have and to let them become the imposter and you the expert, because we will be an expert in certain fields, areas that we know truly, like Vicki, you know, Word and HTML. How many would know it as well as you do? Uh, others will be struggling. So if they, you know, say, oh, darn, I don't know how to do X, Y, or Z, you could pop up and say, hey, I know how to do that. Let me show you, you know, and share your knowledge and bring them more into feeling uh, valued than to feel less valued. And then uh, there are some, there's all the research that I did and there's more stuff about me than you really want to know. And that last slide is SCC related. So I won't show that. Um, so let me look at the chat here. Um, Let's see, I think, okay, so, so Francis says, Vicki, great term, failed expert syndrome, pairs well as an aspect of imposter syndrome. It does, it does, but um, I would say we should never say that we failed anything. We should accept that we are going to learn more about the thing that we think we failed on, and we're, it's not a failure. We're going to strive to learn at least one thing about that thing we think we don't know about. If we do that, then I think we, within our own selves, should be successful. And Bobby, I think the follow-up is key, sharing with the person who observed you being wrong that, our, that you discovered something new or the right answer, that goes a long way. It does. Um, I mean, owning up to, hey, I was wrong, and here's what I learned about that. Um, that bridges uh, a nice gap. Yes, it's hard to do. 
it is very hard to do in a work setting, but I think we can do it. Um, and Barbara agrees that uh, about things being uh, humility as well. And Leslie, sometimes they don't give the information because they don't know it and don't want to admit it. It's very true. This happens more times than we agree. But again, I think more to my thing of asking a question and getting them to participate. And it can be a simple question as so what, like Vicki started this as a hot dog, a sandwich. Get them talking about something they love and then throw in a question of, oh, by the way, how does X, Y, Z work? They're going to, you've got them talking about something else and then they're just going to go, oh, oh, I gave you an answer. And you, you know, you have to warm them up to you is what I would say. And then as well, uh, Leslie sharing, there have been several times when I've asked the experts question that said, oh, I didn't think of that. And very true, because if we do our research and we say, you know, did you think about the users are going to use this thing this way? No, we didn't think about that. Well, what if they did use it that way? What are the um, ramifications? Is there something that's going to hurt them or will they have discovered a way of using this that we did not anticipate? Because how many of us have discovered something about a tool or some other thing that was not it was not meant for the use that we're using it for, but we're doing it, darn it, because it does it the best way. I mean, I have people who love to use Excel as their documentation tool because it has nice, beautiful lines and keeps everything in a cell. That's just what they want to use. I, you know, use Excel for what it's meant to be, for financial stuff. Um, so in the essence of time, I'm a few minutes over. I'm going to give it back to Ms. Vicki and Marilee. Well, thank you, Jackie. So this is the time where I think in our reactions, we can applaud. There we go. And we say, thank you, yes. thank you. But I also want to thank everybody who participated in the discussion. I am really proud of you <laughs> that we were able to have uh, some discussion. I am going to now stop the recording and that way we can talk freely if we'd like. I can, there we go.